Welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at Bluefontein, South Africa, at the University of the Free State, where we're going to be speaking about food systems. And I have with me four faculty members, all of whom are involved in the food orbit. Uh, and so our first guest is uh, Johan van Niekerk. Then we have Anati Makamani. Then we have Marike Labushekne. And then we have Frike Mari. Welcome to all of you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and making the time and having me here at the university. Um, maybe, Johan, if we could start with you. Do people have a right to food, A, and then B, if they do, w what rights do they have? Yes, definitely. People have a, a right to food in South Africa. Our constitution says that people have a right to good and nutritious food. And that is why nowadays we talk about food nutrition security and not only food security anymore. And that food security is not just whether it's clean food, but the, a certain number of calories or a certain amount of food as well? That's exactly the truth, because people people can have enough food, but it, it, it maybe it is not good food. So a food must be nutritious when it's food nutrition security, and we are focusing on that. Okay, and what if, and maybe I can throw this to everybody, what happens if we can't, if everybody can't afford the food, or certain people want food that might be more expensive than others? How do we deal with that issue? That's an interesting one, Steve, but um, there's quite a few things that we actually, you know, consider when we speak about food security and food nutritious, nutrition security, that is, there's, there's issues of handling as well, because um, quite often people do have access to the food and the food is available, but then they don't necessarily have the, 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 the skills to handle it correctly. So um, issues of storage, how do you cook it so that it can be nutritious and it doesn't lose its nutritious value. So there's quite a few things that we put into play when we, when we speak about, you know, the right to food. So it's not just about it being available and people having the access to it, but also having the right skills to handle um, the food. Well, Nati, that point is a really interesting one because since I've been in South Africa, I noticed that there was an electricity issue, uh, to put it mildly. And so what happens if we don't can't refrigerate food? What happens to the food? Does it go bad? Or how do we ensure that the food that you're getting, an ice cream or, uh, or some eggs, are not bad? <laughs> so the electricity crisis, I mean, that's our everyday concern. And it's a, it's, it's a conversation that has been going on for quite some time now. And not only do we see it affecting, you know, just household level, um, when we do speak of food, it affects the food industry as a whole. So it, 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 it extends to refrigeration. It extends to equipments that we use um, for processing, for example. So, um, yes, with, with communities or with households that don't have the necessary refrigeration or um, that by just to, you know, just to eat at the moment, they are badly affected when it comes to, to um, load shedding or power outages, that is. But what do you do? What do people do if all of a sudden you don't have the electricity? And you, I assume a big hotel or a big university like this one has all sorts of backup systems. But what does somebody do who's just in a small house? So what we have seen it ha uh, with, with, with load shedding is that it has, you know, led to food insecurity quite a lot. Um, not only with just um, the spoilage of food, if you can't keep it or refrigerate it, but also with the prices. We've seen there has been quite an increase in food prices because with big companies or big su supermarkets that have back up, that comes at a cost and ultimately it leads to an increase in food prices. So they, there's quite a, a you know, a, a interlink, you know, with all of these things. But what we do, I don't know, maybe my colleagues can, can advise what do the communities or small households do in such cases? I think, I think people are, it's very difficult for people at this stage. I think a lot of food insecurity has, has evolved from this whole situation. So, and, and I think that's something that, that should be that should receive attention, you know, that, that we see if we can improve the situation. Because at, at this stage, I, I think people are just, food is spoiling and being thrown away because of, of the situation. And that food, but that could be, uh, now I understand that you're an expert in plant uh, food, but I assume this also includes meats and, and, and other goods as well that, that are spoiling. Mm -hmm. I think, Steve, if we look at our whole food value chain, talking about food security, 
And what I'm out of mention is quite important if it comes to the price of food. Now, food security in essence is can be on, I want to say, country level. Is there enough food to feed the people? But then the two more important facts is access to food and do you have enough spendable income to actually purchase the food? So, um, and the, the, the disposable income part is, is getting a problem when food prices are increasing. So if you look at South Africa, we are the most food secure country in, in Africa. I think in a world we are 5,600 list, if I remember correctly in terms of food security, but still we have a lot of hunger in South Africa. And that is mostly because people cannot afford, as your honor have said, good quality food. Um, and some cannot afford food at all. Now, if you look at a meat system, for example, in South Africa, we have more than enough livestock to feed a population. But currently with the electricity crisis, we see what we call a bottleneck. So abattoirs have to operate on um, the need electricity to have the cold rooms running to have the slaughter chain running and the electricity problems are just creating a bottleneck there so the food is moving slower through the processors and then increasing not only the cost because they have to run generators or make use of solar power but it also then um increase the price at a the price and the amount of food that actually end up in the retail um and yeah, that's great. That's creating quite a difference in the price between the farm level and the final consumer level. And people just have to pay more for food, even though they, before this crisis, could not afford it. That's really, well, one, it's an interesting point, but two, it's a very sad point. But what can a university do, this one or any other university? I'm assuming you teach students and about uh, food issues. That's why there's a whole department here. But what can you possibly teach students to do if, in fact, your food is going bad and, and the food is having trouble getting to the market and the cost keeps going up? You might have the best university in the world, but if those factors are still there, how does that connect? Steve, I think from, and that's a question all the co colleagues should answer as we are working in different fields, but the main purpose of a university is to do research, give class, but the research part is especially important as we have to make policy recommendations. And I think with this whole crisis, we should look at how to better distribute food and how to decrease the price of food. And that from a university side is done through research to see if there's, I want to say, better, easier, cheaper solutions to get food to the final consumer so that he or she can afford it. Um, and yeah, according to me, that's where the university really plays a role in larger society um, to provide that policy direction. I can also add to that, I had a privilege to visit Spain last year, and what I saw there is a very local food system. And I think in South Africa, we can move towards also local food systems where small producers are producing small amounts of food, but the, the people around that community can can eat that food. So it's not a long value chain. So I think that's something we can adapt to because we have m uh, many informal set um, settlements also, and we need to, to create jobs there. And if we have a small food system, it's not a long value chain, and maybe we can get more food to people via a small local food system. Do you mean the issue of, of, of the food being locally sourced so that way it has to travel a shorter distance? Yes, and eating more in season. So uh, if you plant tomatoes, you sell the tomatoes directly to the market when it's not going through a whole value chain. It's more staying in a local food system. It's staying to a local um, community. It's also more nutritious, I think, if food can be harvested and eat it two, two three days after that and not going to coolers or a long value chain in the food system. But let me challenge that a little bit, if I may, because, you know, I, again, I'm not South African, but I know something about South Africa, but not as much as you all do. But there are these very large supermarkets that I've seen, uh, Pick and Pay and other uh, ShopRite and other large supermarkets. And it seems to me from when I come to South Africa, which is a fair amount, that a lot of people get their food, their food from those markets. And so is it really realistic for people in a big city like Johannesburg or Durban or Cape Town, let's say, to get all their food from a local market as opposed to a big national 
chain. Maybe if I could throw that to you guys. And um, yes, Steve, I think we have to distinguish between the cities and the rural. We still have a very large rural population and small scale farmers uh, produce for, for those regions. And I think that would be especially applicable for, for the rural areas. And, and where the rural areas, they don't only have to cope with electricity problems, but all with, all, also with climate change and, and uh, you know, less rainfall and drier conditions, which is also affecting the, the security. Um, so, so, so it's a different system in the rural areas than in the cities, I think. Hmm, that's interesting. The, you know, that's right. I, I, I hadn't factored that in because there is just such a tremendous difference between Bloemfontein and Johannesburg. Uh, for an American uh, audience, they may not necessarily know the difference, but uh, that's like the difference between New York City and, and parts of rural Indiana. Uh, you know, very significant difference. So where would we go in terms of this local argument? How would you deal with that? And I understand that in the, in the context of the rural area. But in terms of the cities, if we can get to that just for a second, how do we serve the large population of Johannesburg with the big supermarkets with these challenges? Well, I think, yeah, it, it, it's because I, we've had the crisis for quite some time. And over the years, most of us have been hopeful that a solution would come um, and we wouldn't have to find ourselves in having to come up with mitigating strategies. So, uh, yeah, I think it would be quite an interesting, um, yeah, to see how it can, how we can tap into it in big cities and how we can localize the food systems. I can add to that. Um, South Africa is a country which also bounced back. And we have a huge energy crisis currently in the country. But if you fly to Cape Town or Johannesburg, you go to land on the airport, you can see on the rooftops of all the big buildings and the shopping malls, there are solar panels. So I think, in a way, we are being forced to go to green energy because of the energy crisis we have. And most of those big companies are investing in that. So if they can keep the food cool or um, they can serve that community around there. And also South Africa has a huge urban population, like Prof. Marika has said, and also a big rural community. And it, it's, it is two different communities. People in rural areas can't usually afford to go to a big company. So, so for them, a local food system will really assist. But in urban areas, maybe they earn a bit more money, so they can go to the supermarkets and buy good food. And let's talk about that issue of good food. So what is good food? In the United States, there's this tremendous conflict between uh, people who, who posit that plant-based uh, food is sustainable and that meats are not because it takes more energy, it takes more money, it takes more water, it takes more resources to produce uh, meat that people can eat. Is that so here as well? I think that's a... <clears throat> issue that there are a lot of angles that you need to consider. If you look at things like the carbon and water footprints that is published on foods, it, it is true that meat, or different kind of meat, but especially red meat, have this huge water footprint. And they say, but you have so many Olympic swimming pools worth of water to produce one kilogram of beef, while it's not a case for if you look at plant-based proteins like pulses, etc. But then you should also consider the type of water in the water footprint, where this water originates from. So if we use South Africa, for example, most of our beef is produced in parts of the country that can, or not only beef, beef and sheep and lamb, is produced in parts of the country that can be classified as semi-desert. So it's a non-arable land. You can only produce livestock on that land. And if you then look at the water footprint of these products, then it is actually very small because the cattle is grazing on natural grazing. Yes, it still have a green water footprint um, from, I want to say, rainfall. But if you do not produce red meat in these areas, there will be no production and then you basically hurt food security in the country. So, yes, there's difficult issues around all of that. But we have to carefully consider actually the origin of the food and take it in relation with larger um, food security issues. 
If you talk about carbon footprint, just for example, now that we are start to deal in carbon credits with the rest of the world and companies in Europe and the USA that needs to buy carbon credits to basically offset their own carbon footprint. In South Africa, there's currently a big drive as the um, the livestock farms in South Africa with the large amount of natural grazing that they use are actually, I want to say, carbon positive. So the natural grazing takes up more carbon than the animals actually produce. So it, it is actually, it depends on where the food came from and how it is produced. So you shouldn't only consider this 15,000 liters of water for a kilogram beef and that's the benchmark for the whole world. You should look at where it comes from and what resources are actually used. That was the most interesting answer to that I've ever heard. Uh, thank you, because I think that that's really interesting because I think we often think about that as an either or situation, but you're pointing out that it's a little more nuanced than that. Oh, definitely. That's interesting. And in terms of the plant-based aspect of that, how do we do the best we can to make sure that the plants are growing in a way that's reasonable for where that land is coming from in the first place, right? Because there's obviously a difference between an area that gets a lot of rain and an area that doesn't get a lot of rain. Yes, and, and especially now with the climate change, it's it's having a huge influence in, in all of Africa, you know, that, that conditions are becoming drier and that... You know, farmers just don't have a reliable and predictable rainfall anymore. So, so, so there's also a move towards developing plants that are more resilient, climate resilient, all in all, in terms of heat and and climate. And then also uh, uh, looking at genetic improvement of crops for for better nutritional value, like iron content, zinc content, uh, vitamin A content, and and some of the fats and so on. So. So, so there's a lot of, of developments happening in Africa that are actually very exciting and, uh, you know, that, that, that could improve the whole food security system. Well, let's, let's talk about some of those. So in terms of the plant development, is, are you doing, or anybody in this group, doing any research that has something to do with developing plants that might, and I don't want to use the word GMO, I realize that's a tough word, genetically modified uh, I guess crops or, or organizations or organisms, but but is there a way that you do that in a way that is ethically okay to, to modify things? Yes, I, I think in in the whole of Africa, there's there's a, a lot of resistance to GM crops in any way. So there's a lot of conventional improvement happening without without in, uh, you know involving bio, biotechnology or bioengineering. So. And there's been huge strides being made in, in on the continent for developing uh, climate resilient crops and and more nutritional crops uh, just just through through conventional breeding techniques. Could you give us an example of one thing that might have? Yes, uh, if you look at orange sweet potatoes, for example, you know you you suddenly see them everywhere. And and twenty or thirty years ago, all the sweet potatoes were were actually white, and. Uh, now suddenly people can eat orange sweet potatoes, they can eat orange uh, 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 cassava and, and rice and everything that's been enhanced with, with uh, pro-vitamin A, which is a huge problem in Africa causing blindness and uh, cognitive problems in kids. And, and there's, there's been huge strides being made uh, through, through breeding, improving those, those traits and iron and zinc content as well, which, which is a huge problem in, in, in children in Africa. That's interesting. I also want to add, Steve, um, as a university, our mandate is to train students and also to, to do some research. But it's very important that our research gets out to the people out there to do actually what we're doing with research here all about. So we have learned from the USA that they have land grant universities where students are actually working in the field, transferring the knowledge which they learn at the university and taking that to the farmers. And we have experimental farm here on campus. We also we, we train people from communities and students what actually we are doing research on. And our naughty year is head of our department for, for agricultural extension, which is actually the department which is supposed to take the research to the people and to be the agent between the farmers and the university. And if, if, if farmers have a certain need for some research, they need to tell us about that. And if we do some research, like my what I is doing 
it must get out to the farmers. So as a university, we are really trying to link the research to the farmers and make that relevant. Well, to that question, and I think, how do you do that? How do you affirmatively go out and do that? So we have what we call agriculture extension, also known as agriculture advisory services. So they normally work as the middleman be be between research as well as the farmer. So if Marika comes in and she's telling us about plant breeding in the most technical terms, a normal person or a farmer rather would not necessarily understand those. And the extension would then work as a middleman to try and disseminate the information from her in a language that they would more or less understand. So it acts as a link between research and communities. So if there is training or programs or projects that we as the university or other researchers rather feel the farmers or the communities need to know about, if there is, um, you know, new food, um, new crops that we think the farmers or the communities will benefit from, but they need someone that will explain the, it in a, in, a, in a language that they would understand, then extension plays that role. And that extension, is that in verbally or are you writing things down and sharing it? It can be done in various ways, Steve. So it could be verbally, it could be with demonstration, it could be, you know, verbally. We also do have things like farmer field schools where you do the actual demonstration. So after you have left, for example, if Marika is doing um, her research on plant breeding and she wants the community to know about it, um, the best way would be to do a demonstration so that after she has left, the community can be able to to um, to sustain themselves and and continue with it further. And those demonstrations would be on campus or would they be at a farm somewhere? We normally do it on a farm level so that it is an environment that they are familiar with. It doesn't feel like, you know, uh, if they, yeah, it, it doesn't feel like it's it's completely out of their comfort zone. But if they also do not have the necessary facilities, then that's where we do bring them in into the university, for example, using the experimental farm. Well, maybe I could throw this to all of you. So, I, you know, I know that in even in the urban areas, transport is an issue, and it's certainly an issue in the rural areas in South Africa. So how are you going to incentivize somebody who perhaps is very poor, who may be a farmer, who one has to know about the program that the university is doing, two, be available to do it on whatever that day is, and then three, get to that place and reserve the time to do that. That seems like a pretty tall order to have all of those things happen to bring different community members into something like that. That is also a big role of extension. So normally they are quite familiar with the communities and the farmers already. Um, If an outsider like yourself would come and say, I've got a program that I want to introduce to you, chances are they will be quite hesitant to join in or to be on board. But if I myself already work with the community and they know me and I do give them the value of what the project or the program will bring to them, it is quite easy to, you know, for them to be, to jump on board. So it, it, it does take quite a lot because most times they just want to be on their field and it will take quite a lot of time and how are we going to to travel there, but if they do see the value and they understand it based on the conviction that they got from me, then it's much easier for them to. I can add to that, we're also taking hands with a private sector. So we're with a private commercial bank. We have a mentorship program now where we, we, we have currently 120 farmers that we are mentoring. Now, the research that Fricky and Marike and Adati is doing, we are using the lecturers in their departments and taking them to the farmers to train them on the research as a university, but also to link them to the different lecturers where they can ask questions. Because some of them are in the really very remote rural areas, but we are trying to get our lecturers there on ground level to give them some mentorship. When speaking of the mentorship, is do you have some students here who are sons and daughters of farmers? Yes. Oh. And, and are, often are they studying agricultural issues or are they often studying other issues as well? I think it's a, through our university, there's a lot of children of farmers that are studying different things, but in the agricultural faculty, we do have a lot of students um, coming from primary agricultural backgrounds or children of farmers, as we have said. But we must also realize that I want to say 90% of the agricultural students study agriculture and food systems to, as they they are invested or they want to invest in the industry, or they, they have never set a foot on a commercial farm before. 
And I think that is one of the biggest problems that we have, although we try our best to bring some practical knowledge across, a lot of these students graduate from a university and the actual knowledge of practical primary agriculture is still still very scarce. So that is why, as Johanna have mentioned on the experimental farm, in the last number of years we have tried various programs to get the better practical understanding um, across over to these students so that when they leave the university they can not only work better with primary producers but also understand better where the food actually come from and all this theoretical knowledge that I have learned on university how it makes a difference in terms of the practical impl implementation thereof so yeah it's a it's a big mix of students but the largest part is definitely people without the background of primary agriculture. And then in terms of the practical, since we only have a few minutes left, I believe, what, what are some jobs that some of your students are getting to practice who practically who want to work in the field and who have been working in the field? What are some jobs that they would uh, have? I think it depends on the different departments, um, but it is, it's, it's very broad. So um, it can be from practical agricultural farming where you are employed maybe as a farm manager on farm level and physically farm every day of your life and i think closest to that is to be an extension officer where you would give um advice to farmers or working for a feed or a seed or a um agricultural chemical company where you actually sell products and give advice to the farmers so in terms of practical agriculture this really a huge um variety of jobs out there where you can be involved in primary agriculture. Um, just to add on that, Steve, when we do, you know, just based on the conversation that we had on food, it is quite a um, dynamic industry and there's a lot of, you know, jobs that feed into it. So just outside primary agriculture as well, we do have jobs that, you know, feed into processing as well as distribution. We've got jobs that feed into, um, it goes all the way to the consumer, you know. So at the university, um, it links the students to primary agriculture so they can study ag um, animal science to um, agronomy or plant sciences. But we also have agriculture economics, um, which will speak into marketing, issues of management. Um, we also have consumer science. Um, which will, you know, speaks into, you know, I mean, we've got a state of the art sensory lab, but it, it's a very diverse um, or dynamic sector. And we've got quite a lot of jobs that can come out of it. And thank you all very much for taking the time today. If you would like additional information about the University of the Free State, please go to ufs.ac.za. If you would like to send a note to me at the show, please go ahead and send an email to Higher Education Today at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.